Hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to Alta Live. My name is Beth Spotswood. I am the digital editor of Alta Journal, and I am so excited to welcome you today to our conversation with Alta contributor Min Lau and our senior editor, Matt Haber. Today, they're going to talk about Min's recent article, The Challenges of Aging Parents. Um, it's it's going to be a kind of a fascinating conversation. Min wrote about this in the current issue of Alta Journal in an article called Aging in Place. She relays the challenges of living in New York while her aging immigrant parents are in Silicon Valley, where the community that they came up in, where Min grew up in, is changing so rapidly with technology. As her parents are aging, how do they navigate that? How does she help them navigate that from New York? And does she need to move back to the Bay Area? The challenges of aging parents, um, particularly aging parents who are immigrants, is something that so many of us are dealing with. And it's kind of a, an emotional roller coaster and a fascinating topic, especially as it relates to Californians, because this everything just moves so fast here. About Min, she's a chef, culinary consultant, freelance writer, editor, and a longtime New Yorker. She was born in Taiwan and raised in the Bay Area, where she grew up in San Mateo County. In her former life, she was manager of Seattle's Alt Weekly, The Stranger. Her writing from The Stranger has been published in the national anthology Best Food Writing. Woman is based in New York City. His West Coast, her her West Coast roots run deep. She's been a harvest chef for wineries in Oregon's Willamette Valley. She's worked at an oyster farm, um, and she writes for branding and communications agency in the Pacific Northwest. She is in conversation today with her editor, senior editor Matt Haber, who is also, I hope I'm allowed to say this, a longtime friend and colleague. Before I kick this over to Matt and Min. I do want to make my, my spiel for you. Alta Journal, if you are new to us, is an award-winning quarterly magazine focused on California and the West. We are big and gorgeous. This is our brand new issue. You can join us as a member for $50 a year. You get four gorgeous issues of Alta, a baseball cap, a California book club baseball cap, and our guide to indie bookstores of California and the West. You can also join us as a digital member for $3 a month. Plus, for free, we host all sorts of cool events like this, Alta Live every Wednesday at 1230, the California Book Club. Next week, Thursday, the 25th of July is Vanita Blackburn. Um, so check out our offerings if you're new to us and, and want to support our work. Please visit altaonline.com. Consider subscribing to the magazine, joining us in any way you can. This interview will be recorded and posted to altaonline.com later this afternoon. We will send you links to really cool things Min and Matt said throughout this conversation, a recording of the video where you can read Aging in Place at altaonline.com and anything else that might pop up in their conversation. I hope that you will let us know where you're zooming in from in the chat. Um, from Novato, California, I'm gonna get lost and turn this over to Matt. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Min, for joining us. Uh, I'm just going to say right at the top, by way of full disclosure, that Min and I have known each other for decades. Uh, despite looking this young, we've known each other most of our lives. Um, and when I started at Alta, one of the first things I wanted was this piece, because this is something that Min and I have talked about many, many times. So Min, will you please summarize um, the gist of your piece, and we'll get into it. Um, of course. Thank you for, for having me on Alta Live. It's nice to see your face. Um, and yeah, I guess I didn't realize the entire time that I was kvetching to you about my journeys back and forth across the country and about the experiences that I had been having uh, with my folks. Um, I, you know, I didn't realize that, that it was uh, becoming more compelling uh, to you. Um, but what I do know and what I have come to realize is that uh, the more I speak about it uh, publicly, the more I sort of lead with it, the more that I'm open about it in professional situations, uh, among friendships, you know, at events, just the more that it kind of has become a thing that uh, has become a big part of me, um, the more feedback I've gotten about um, about people going through the same thing, people, you know, about Gen Xers going through the same thing. And it and really what it what it has done, it is it's opened my eyes to um, this very sort of um, common and yet silent 
phenomenon yeah. that, that a lot of Gen Xers are going through um, because we're we're at a point in our lives when we're very clearly not done, right? We've got so much more stuff to do. Um, a lot of us are hitting the reset button for the second time and maybe even looking for a third or fourth act. Sure. And, and so and so we do get bogged down with with logistics and with sort of the emotional labor of it all. And I and I want to be really clear. I say all of this as someone who um, isn't complaining. I don't. I'm not trying to get out of this, um, but I do. I do want to make it more a part of the conversation, um, especially because what I have noticed in recent years is that so much of the conversation is about praise culture or achievement culture, right? About how people are killing it and crushing it and and moving forward and like, right. All really important. The cult of hustle. Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I mean, you may know a little something about that being in the Bay Area, uh, but but I, I, you know, I just think it's also important for us to to reflect on this and to and to take a pause and to just talk about it in a in a much more candid way. Yeah, and I think the the piece, which is a beautifully written piece, is not a complaint. It's really about understanding that you have a responsibility that your parents brought you here when you were little they did everything they could to raise you up as an american kid and they're frankly slipping behind now in their american life and it's kind of up to you to to pull them up or at least hold them in place and it sounds logistically challenging financially challenging but really super duper emotionally challenging and i think that you really get at that and i want to understand a little bit how the the immigrant piece plays into that Tell me about um, their struggles with the language and with some of the technology and how that kind of has manifested itself for you now. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, something something that I often get from uh, from from friends who are who are not immigrants um, is, oh, gosh, you mean your folks have been here for this long and they they don't speak the language like they're always really surprised. Mm -hmm. And look, that's a very valid question it's a legit question um they maybe a little impertinent but legit <laughs> well it, i mean yeah i mean it, they so i think that their experience is actually much more common in regions of the country where there are very large and supportive um immigrant uh, communities and mm -hmm. infrastructure for those immigrant communities right um, and so, and they I were super lucky that Millbrae and San Francisco oh were my, that for decades. Oh my gosh! I mean, they could not have picked a better spot, and I mentioned that in the piece. Um, they had no idea of knowing; they didn't do any research. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and actually, at the time when when we first arrived in Millbrae, believe it or not, I mean, current day Millbrae, you know, is very Asian, but at the time, like that was not the case at all. Mm -hmm. um, it was a it was a very working class uh, next to the airport town, uh, and we were very much the minority. I was very much the minority kid in, in mm -hmm. Millbury Public Schools. Uh, that did change later on, uh, and I you know I want to I want to be very upfront about that. Um, it changed very rapidly, but but our early days looked very different than Millbury does today, and it's really important to to stress that. But but so. Um, I think a, I think a lot of immigrant uh, families from that era, we're talking late seventies, early eighties, um, had that experience of feeling so um, frightened and overwhelmed, um, and and finding their community and burrowing deep, and um, you know finding work amongst the community, you know uh, having having a social network that was that was solely in that mm -hmm. community and the next thing you know yes they are and i say this in the piece i mean they're very much u.s citizens on paper uh they they very Pay all much, their taxes you know, they, they do yeah they're i mean everything is is everything is um is very american except for their day-to-day -day lives um and they never did leave the uh the sort of the bubble of of their chinese community and for a long time, it worked out. It was okay. Their community was uh, so supportive for each other. Um, people showed up for each other. It's why I felt like it was okay to leave, mm -hmm. um, even though even at 18, I knew I was on borrowed time because that's just instilled into you as an immigrant child um, that that it's your <clears throat> that it's your it's your duty. 
uh, and an only child and a, and a female child. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Um, cherry on top. Yes. Only child, female child. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I, and I think that, I think that now, um, because we, uh, we're in a, we're in a position where so much of their immediate community has either sadly, you know, passed away, gotten, um, you know, gotten into situations where um, elder care is involved, or they've moved back to Taiwan, uh, where elder care is more affordable. I mean, for whatever reason, you you know, as you age, um, and we're we're going to step into this too. You know, in a few decades, as you age, you realize yes, your world does get smaller for very organic reasons, and when that happens, how do you then sustain that infrastructure? That you need for uh, for independent living, um, and uh, the other thing that happened, of course, beyond this, um, is that being in the Bay Area, they had a front row seat to the analog and digital divide, um, and it was swift and it was harsh and very unforgiving. Um, and you know, they they were hard workers. They they've always held down jobs. Um, you know, sure, blue collar jobs, but jobs nonetheless. And um, now, you know, they they look back and they realize that they were forced into, I guess you could say, retirement um, long before they were ready because of this digital and analog divide. And that's something that is not exclusive to um, sure. communities. I mean, everybody has this story or if they're lucky they have the story of having to teach their mom or their dad how to use the phone and struggling with the remote won't work and this won't work but it's 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 even more challenging i think for your family because yeah. banking um hospital portals all of doctors appointments all of it's through the phone and they the way you describe it they're very alienated by the phone and afraid that they're gonna like get hacked or something 100 percent. i mean they they don't so my mom doesn't you know my mom right doesn't speak or or write or read English. My dad is conversational, um, but his his writing and reading is not at a level where he feels comfortable doing much of anything. Um, and so- And the phones are alienating. I mean, if yeah. you haven't used it your whole life and then suddenly you get this thing. Absolutely, absolutely. And they're just that much more intimidated. And I, and I just think because of their experiences and because of what sort of happened to them up that the things that happened to them up until their their uh, their arrival here in the states, I think they're just and and I'm sure a lot of a lot of Im immigrant first gen kids can relate to this. They're just led by fear. I mean, they just move through the world very very differently. There isn't that confidence. There isn't that optimism. Um, and as someone who was raised here, right, who was raised on follow your dreams. Mm -hmm. We'll never have to work a day. Move you know, as, to New York. Yeah, as someone who was who was raised very much amongst American pop culture, I you know yes, there there's so much code switching that I think um, we end up doing to 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 try to like respect and honor what their experiences were, um, but yet to be very careful to not let that stain our experience. Mm -hmm. um, but the other side of the, the tech thing, sorry to cut you off, no, 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 is please. that you have been able to use all of these platforms well, and the phone funny. to yeah. remotely help them from New York. So tell us yeah. a little bit about like some of this came up during COVID. Some of this came just because of yeah. developments in certain apps, uh, TaskRabbit, et cetera. How do you manage their lives from 2000 miles away? I, well, that, yeah, I mean, I... In, in some ways I hate the internet and in some other ways I love the internet and I couldn't do this without the internet and sure. without 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 these apps and without being so tech forward um I definitely would have moved back home in like 2017 right I mean full stop we would have hung out so much more yes it's true <laughs> um I I I do you know I do uh realize that that uh the very thing that um that that interrupted their lives um, as they knew it is also the very thing that has enabled me to, to help them out so much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, during the pandemic, um, so much of the, you know, so much of Amazon and delivery and everything else was a big part of how I made sure they were okay. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, everyone knows about Zooming with doctors and doing everything remotely now. Um, TaskRabbit is 
huge. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you said there were some Mandarin speaking task rabbits who could help yes. them out. And they, yes, yes. And um, uh, especially during the height of lockdown, but even mm -hmm. after, you know, even beyond that, it, you know, and the fact that the fact that I'm able to remotely with my Uber account get a car to pick up my mom for an appointment. I mean, all of these little things uh, are, are so, are, you know, they're, I wouldn't say that it's completely seamless, but it, and it, and it certainly takes up a lot of time and energy. It's depleting in its own way, Yeah. but, um, but I'm, I'm able to do it on my phone. I'm able to still sort of try to hang on to um, a, a semblance of, of, of my own rhythm and my own life here. Well, you describe, which a lot of people probably can identify with having to do calls with doctors in the broom closet at work or, mm -hmm. totally. you know, stolen moments between catching subways and whatever. Um, that absolutely happened. Yes. I mean, I, I, know, I know I've, you've I've, got I've, another full-time job. Your full-time job is your parents and then th there's your life and your own work. So how do you balance it? How do you juggle it? Um, I mean, I, I try to, I try to, I try to take it day by day. I try not to let um, the anticipatory anxiety take over. Um, I think one of the smartest things I've done so far is really invest in multi-generational friendships so that I'm able to really get support from different angles. And, um, you know, it's... A lot of it, I mean, a lot of it is uh, friends being not only supportive, but not keeping score. And what I mean by that is to understand and have grace for why maybe I'm not getting back to them, right? Mm -hmm. Or to understand why sometimes my scheduling can be so sporadic. Um, or why you got to jump on a plane sometimes and be gone. A hundred percent. I mean, I've definitely, you know, canceled on a lot of people and and um I'm just you know my communication style has has really changed it has become less consistent mm -hmm. um I'm I'm probably in all honesty not as good of a friend as I was before this whole situation really ramped up um and I and I'm very open about it and like I said earlier um in our talk um I I do lead with it sometimes and that has mm -hmm. cost me some relationships I mean for real I think I you know I probably um uh, not the you know I'm it's a little bit of a drag sometimes you know um it's not it's not sexy I know that um but I think a lot of it is just radical acceptance um not trying to like look for a side exit and 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 really walking into it knowing that like okay um there are some things that are inevitable um, that are non-negotiable, um, that are so wrapped up in culture and tradition. Um, and, and I, and I think navigating that is gonna, it's gonna be really nuanced. It's part of why I wanted to, to write about it. Um, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a slow process. You know, change is a process. It's not mm -hmm. an event, right? So I think I'm gonna, I'm, I think I'm slowly making my way back west by really, <clears throat> especially lately, I've noticed myself doing this lately, really trying to squeeze a lot of joy out of the time I have here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, 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 the months that I do have here consecutively, I've been, I've been really making the most of them. Yeah. So the, the inevitability of you moving back west is one of the themes of the piece. And um, one of the, the things I wish that we had more of was your recollections of the San Francisco and the Bay Area that you left and then coming at it with new eyes. Yeah. So you've come back many times. What yeah, do you make of this place now? I mean, what's you you mentioned the Hunger Games uh, as a description, but what do you make of the Bay Area in 2024 uh, compared to when you were a kid? I mean, it's wild. It's 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 I have really distinct visual memories um of um of just, you know, of, I I might have mentioned this before, but of, of a much more working class town yeah well you you also probably have auditory memories because you're a food person and that's sure. probably part of it yeah uh absolutely i mean i i i certainly remember oh factory i meant not auditory factory. I, I certainly remember the the city itself 
feeling much more um, congested, feeling much more like like there was energy on the sidewalks. Pe- pedestrians mm-hmm. were a thing. Like it was, it felt there was a there was more of a bustle to it. And I, you know, I wonder maybe is it just because I was a little kid? But no, I do. I mean, I do remember even as as far even up to the point where I was a teenager driving in the city and going into the city for shows and meeting friends, it just felt, um, it felt like there was just like more people out on the street. Um, and now I go and it, it, you know, it sure. I mean, there are streets I don't recognize. I mean, you know, Cesar Chavez was army street when I lived there, you know, I mean, there, there are things like that, but um, there, there, there is, yeah, I have noticed that in the city itself, it just, it feels a little more subdued. That could just mm-hmm. be times I've been um, now, of course, in Millbrae where my folks are and in San Mateo County and in the Bay area, I mean, that's been, that's those have, I've seen massive visual changes. I mean, just, just a lot of development, um, you know, again, that Asian American infrastructure, the amount of, just Asian signage and restaurants and, and um, yeah, and, and malls. I mean, it, the, just the growth has really exploded. Um, and I, I'm, I'm happy for my folks, you know, I'm glad that they have, uh, that they have, that they can go to these places. I'm, you know, I'm happy to see them in a safe community. Um, but, uh, but it does, it does feel when I'm there, um, like I'm a, I'm like a, a stranger in a strange land. It, yeah. it does feel Do like you feel like you're going to fit somewhere when you come back? Gosh, I, I mean, that's that's another one of those like one day at a time things. I, it's it will truly feel like starting from scratch. Um, it will, you know, it will f- feel very foreign for a long time. But that's okay. I mean, I've I've done this before. I've moved, you know, I've moved to different mm-hmm. cities before. Um, at one point, I lived in Seattle, and I still have a lot of community in Seattle. Um, but yeah, it is, it is, it is very daunting. And, um, and, you know, I, I look at the, I look at the housing costs and, you know, yeah, yeah, like, you know, it is, it is pretty, it is, it is pretty drastic how, how the, how the prices have increased. Yeah. Um, And I, I mean, I, you know, not to reveal too much, but I know you and I know that you love New York and that you're just, you're the New Yorkiest New Yorker. So I wonder if that's going to be hard to leave that behind too for a while. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I love New York the way, you know, you love a person. Um, and I have, I have a lot of flaws and all I have, a, I have a lot of community here. Um, but, but, you know, I, this, and this is the, this is the, the sort of the Chinese kid in me again. I, when I do go home and when I do, you know, when we go to Costco and we do all the sort of errand things that we do when I'm there, when I'm home and and when I see how much they're slowing down um and I recognize uh just how how much more hands-on I'm gonna have to get um you know I I just know that that for me I wouldn't be able to enjoy New York um if I knew that they were starting to really you know suffer in their day-to-day and yeah. thankfully that's that's not imminent imminent like it's not happening tomorrow or next month but I you know especially with my dad but both both of them have had some medical stuff come up and I've had to keep a closer eye on it and I just do know that at you know at any point like I might need to be there for longer and this is you know again I just want to be really clear about this I know that this is very universal like this is not exclusive to just an immigrant kid or you know just just my Chinese family like I'm hearing iterations of this so often now. I, I actually do think that we're having like a very Gen X zeitgeisty summer yeah. with a lot of, I mean, with just with with books and with content. And I and I do I do appreciate that like this is a a point of tension that I think so many of us in our late 40s, early 50s, and beyond are are you know are dealing with and. Like the numbers, I mean, talk about not sexy. The numbers are are really sober. Um, I mean, we're so Gen Xers, those between those born between 60, 1965 and 1980 ish, we're about 20 percent of the population right now. Right. Um, but. By 2034, which is not that far off, um, there's going to be more Americans over 65 than there are children. 
Wow. And, and, you know, I just like, I, I, I think that, I think that this is something that, um, that we're all going to have to kind of re- be more interdependent on, you know, mm-hmm. have, having more open conversations with, with our, not just with our family members, but with our, with our communities and our yeah. f- close friends and maybe not so close friends. And probably and- our employers and everybody who's part of our lives. Yeah. yeah. Would, would love to see an elder care tax credit. Just saying. Um, but yeah, so I mean, th- like there are just at every level, legislative, community, personal, whatever, relational, pr- professional. Um, the like, I do think that this is a, an us problem that we're all having to solve and talk about. Um, and there's been a lot of, and I mean, I you know, I was inspired uh, to to even dive in to write this piece for you because there's been some great stuff written about this as well. Um, You know, uh, Ada Calhoun wrote a a great book called Why We Can't Sleep that really kind of like jump-started this whole whole topic for me. Um, There, yeah, there've been, Angela Garbes wrote a really beautiful book called Essential Labor that really talks about the the economies of care. Um, We'll share some of these in the the email. And also I, I remember you cited a few articles that we cut that we can put back into the links that Beth sends out to our uh, Yeah, the, con- our the, viewers. the dialogue is really expanding. Yeah. And I'm happy to see that, as it should be. Well, in, the, in an effort to expand the dialogue even more, let's bring Beth back, and she will give us some questions. Um, I'm going to be quiet, but thank you, Min. And uh, Beth, take it away. You're going to have to be quiet, Matt. Chime on in. Um, question for you, Min. What about, do you know if there are any... And and maybe this is covered in kind of some of those articles that that didn't or that didn't make this article some some links that didn't make it in there. Um, what about people in your parent situation who don't have kids or certainly don't have kids um, and younger people in their family with the ability to fly back and forth to handle things like Task Rabbit and and you know navigate the world for them? Um, how are they dealing with all of this? I know. I mean, I think about that all the time. There are, I mean, I like, if you are, if you are aging in place or attempting to age in place and you're elderly and you don't have kids, I mean, I think that your most immediate sort of community resources, you know, might be seeing if there are, if there are, you know, sort of senior groups or, or, or assisted living groups, um, there are some, I know in San Mateo County, I've looked into it that are volunteer based. Um, you know, obviously there's like a version of Meals on Wheels, you know, in 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 larger cities, but that really rules out rural communities. So that is, I mean, I think that is a, a, a you know, a, a huge issue. Um, it is, yeah, I, I agree. It is, um, it is really, it's, it's a complex issue. And I, you know, I do wonder if, um, if at the local level, if at the municipal level, there are enough senior services right now for exactly what that reader is asking about. I mean, yeah, it just, and how would you even know where to start if you're uncomfortable with technology using the internet, you know, hopping on Google and finding out what's going on. Sure. And communicate what your needs are yeah. and, and know that these opportunities are out there if there even are. I know. I mean, a, a, a place to a place I've always started is is your local library because the librarians are such superheroes and they can they can sort of do a lot of that deep dive research. We love librarians at Alta, so yeah, yeah libraries. Um, uh, that's sort of just like a knee jerk kind of reaction for for something like that. But uh, yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm I'm just seeing in the chat that someone's from rural Tracy. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that that's a whole nother added layer of um, of logistics. You know. It's, it's, I mean, it can be very much a full-time job for people as yeah. Donna from rural Tracy points out rides to kidney dialysis are not covered. Yeah. Um, yeah. so, and her husband isn't able to drive himself. They rely on friends. Um, another comment from Donna, same here, full-time caregiver for my husband and everything medical is on the phone, email text, but he doesn't right. know how to do, and he can't see well, there's yeah. another barrier. People yeah. who, you know, can't see, can't hear, can't have mobility issues. Yeah. I'm able to help him. But what if he did not have help with the technology? It's clearly a problem. Um, a question from Carrie, again, in the same situation. This is such a pervasive sure. issue. That so many of us are dealing, we're all kind of the same age here. 
Um, how do you keep your energy and mental state in the positive so you can do what you do for your folks? What is, what's your self-care like? Oh gosh. Um, a lot of it has to do with, with truly, um, practically sustaining myself. So self-care for me, you know, doesn't look like <clears throat> a scented candle. Um, it, it really, it really is about making sure that I'm, that I'm eating nutrient dense food, um, that I make sure that no matter what I, um, take great care to, to move my body, um, to stay strong and focused because if something happens to me, my parents are screwed. And that's something that a, a doctor said to me recently, that one of their doctors said to me recently, um, like he really reminded me, like, you must physically at the very basic level, take great care of yourself. I, I do, um, yeah, I do, I do pay a lot more attention to sort of my, you know, my diet and exercise. Um, and then as far as emotionally goes, I no longer skimp on sleep. <laughs> like I have to make sure I'm sleeping. I have to, you know, it is, it is really paramount that I prioritize rest um, because I do have to keep so much of this um, uh, organized. Um, and, and I, you know, I do, I'm, I'm so grateful for, for a friend group that's very understanding that doesn't keep score um, mm -hmm. that um, have been patient enough to sort of listen to the same thing over and over again. Um, and, and, and really um, just knowing that, knowing that, that I'm, I'm showing up for them in, in the best way that I can, even though it's not always the ideal way, um, you know, and forgiving myself when I need to. That sounds very emotionally, emotionally healthy. Um, we got an email from Pam folks. Don't forget. You can always email us questions. If you can't make it live, we will ask your questions. Um, wondering if you have any advice to navigate and address cultural resistance yeah. resources for help um, as a respite and hospice care services. In other words, how to address the mentality that all assistance should come from family. Yeah, I struggle with that a lot. Um, it's, you know, it, it's so ingrained, it's so deeply ingrained in my very traditional Chinese family that, that it is, it is, it's solely on, you know, on my shoulders. Um, but I have, uh, over the years, you know, had um, had some tough conversations with both my folks about what what care would look like if even if it was uh, part time, and you know, and that's only if I can afford it, right? It's only if we, I mean, if if we're able to financially do to do so, which is a whole nother conversation. But um, a lot of it comes down to uh, their willingness. I mean, because they are so private, their their willingness to let someone they don't know in their home. Um, it's that's an ongoing dialogue. Um, yeah, it's a lot of times. I think the tricky balance for those of us in this position is we also need to remind ourselves that in their minds, at least, they're still very much the parent. They're still very much the authority figure. Um, culturally and and in every other way they and I and I want to make sure that I uh, maintain that dignity for them even if I'm like scrambling behind the scenes and making decisions and doing stuff and banking online and you know even if I'm if I'm kind of taking over quietly um I I I want to I want to make sure that I respect that that they feel like they're still part of the discussion and that I'm not just telling them what to do because even at their age even if someone is elderly and a little more fragile um they still there is still the possibility that your elderly parent could just like shut you down and make that um make that even more make that process even more difficult um there there's i mean that that whole thing comes up a lot too of just of sort of like arguing among siblings or you know or or, or things like that. So it's, yeah, it is, gosh, I, I wish I, I wish I had better advice, but it is, um, it is about sort of gingerly approaching the topic, talking about it, um, as gently and respectfully as possible and knowing that it's going to take a long time. None of this, none of this is going to be efficient. Like I've made my peace with that. I can't treat this the same way I treat a project management situation at work or, you know, what have you, or, or if it were, if it were something 
for myself. Like this, there's just going to be two steps forward and one step back and maybe even three steps back sometimes. And part of, part of this is part of, part of this like radical acceptance is knowing that that's just going to, it's going to take as long as it takes. You are an amazing daughter. I mean, <laughs> let it be said it is, on the record. <laughs> seriously. Like I've got to call my parents right now. It'd be really nice to them. And well, I have a question them. related to that, which is, do your parents know about the piece and have they seen it? You know, they have always been just kind of shruggy about, um, about writing about my, you know, about this stuff. Sure. I mean, they, they know. And, and, and I think, I think because there's the language barrier, I think they're just a little bit like, do what you think is best, do what you think you, you know, but I, I, there's, they're, they kind of keep that stuff at arm's length. They've kept a lot of, um, a lot of uh, like what I do at arm's length. They, they don't, you know, I mean, God bless them. You know, they're Chinese parents. They, they, they don't quite know what to make of what I do for a living, right? Um, this like hybrid multi-hyphenate, like, is she cooking? Is she writing? What is content? You know, all this stuff. Like, um, so they're, I mean, they're, don't get me wrong. They're lovely. They, they don't ever, um, there's never been any resistance. There's never been any hostility, but they're just like, they're private and they're, they very much live their lives with their heads down. Um, and yeah, they, they just, they just kind of shrug at it and go, okay, great. We have gone over time. This has been such a fascinating conversation. Min, thank you so much for being so transparent and vulnerable and open with us. And Matt, thanks for navigating this interview. This was fantastic. Thank you both so very much. Thank you to our wonderful audience for tuning in today. Um, we, again, we will send you links to read Min's article. You can rewatch this, send it to your friends who are caring for their parents or send it to your kids so that they know how to behave when you get old. Um, and join us next week. We are going to talk with author, uh, Alta contributor, Bethany Kaler about the backstory behind Berkeley's secret hot tub. And it's going to be a fantastic convo. So that is July 24th, 1230 uh, Alta Live. Um, again, Matt Haver and Min Lau, thank you both so very much for joining us today. Thanks to the audience. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.